Terry Gilliam's Brazil, undoubtedly a wacky and crazy and memorable movie. One of the most craziest movies and fascinating movies, I think, of the last 40 years. Now, I had been down on this movie for a long time. I did a Terry Gilliam director video, which I actually downplayed Brazil because I really actually like his many of his other movies better. But I rewatched Brazil recently, and I have read 1984, the George Orwell book, many, many times. And I kind of finally saw what Brazil was up to, and here's what I think. It helped me to read that Gilliam called this 1984 and a half, but this is not a remake of George Orwell's famous novel, one of the most famous novels of the last 80 to 90 years. It's definitely a movie that riffs on it, and it's its own world, especially it's a world of film and film images, from Metropolis all the way up to movies of the 1930s. The aesthetic is retro-futuristic in which the characters are wearing Casablanca-like clothes from uh, movies from the 30s and early 40s, and even Casablanca is quoted in this movie. He's looking at you. He's looking at you. And the characters are also watching movies. So this is a movie in part about movies and movies' effect on people and what are the movies dreams, idle dreams, visions of an alternative reality that can't be realized when we might be in the world of the all- powerful state, the totalitarian state that dominates all of life, including a surveillance state that watches us constantly. This is a Gilliam trope, a Gilliam idea. We're in a reality of a totalitarian state, corporations, governments, both combining to watch us, to surveil us. And then ordinary people, normies, have dreams of or fantasies of alternate environments like tropical locations or rural locations that they can escape to, and even dreams or a way of escaping. That is true in the movie, where the main character, Sam Lowry, dreams of himself as some kind of archangel figure rescuing a babe in the sky or a goddess in the sky. The movie is comparing dreams to reality, and the dreams are the nice, cheesy, futuristic fantasy visions of Sam Lowry versus the real world, which is hard, brutal, impoverished, and it's a police state. Now, in the movie, of course, there's a bumbling bureaucrat, the main character who's a normie who tries to get things done, but is pretty inefficient. Effective. And then there's this hero, Tuttle, this sort of entrepreneurial American-like hero who is going to save him. But the salvation here is helping his AC and his heating system, his ducts in his apartment, whereas the, the socialistic, perhaps socialistic, central services can't fix anything and screws everything up. So in one sense, this movie sort of has the vision or the ideal of the individual versus the state or the rogue entrepreneur, the sort of Star Wars-like American entrepreneur, the rebel figure versus the all-powerful state. And Robert De Niro, in a surprising, weird cameo, plays that sort of hero figure, Robin Hood or Spider-Man or something like that, the classic American outlaw who's going to help everybody out. Now, I mentioned fantasies. The movie is titled Brazil, and that's sort of the postmodern idea here. You'll never get anything about the real Brazil, the country, in this movie. It's only the pop song, the you know early 20th century pop song called Brazil, which is a pop song part about the, you know remembering Brazil fondly in your dreams, being able to go there in your dreams or memories, but possibly, as in the case in the movie, experiencing something the complete opposite of that. So the tropical or exotic location Brazil is just a fantasy in this movie. That's why I actually love the title quite a bit because it fools people. That's part of the notion of the movie, in fact, that it's an idle dream where you're stuck in this harsh reality. Now, I'd like to talk about tone, but really it's the attitude of the movie. It's outrage, it's outrageousness, it's cartoonish, it's aggressive. And by the end of the movie, where we've had all of these dreams, but we can clearly tell dreams from reality. We get to the end about the last 10 to 15 minutes. This is not a spoiler. And there's a fever dream feel to the ending of the movie. And that really is a fascinating tone. You don't get that a lot in movies where there's a whole stretch of expressionistic, formalistic. Uh, Gilliam is almost avant-garde in the end. Not quite, but close. And I think ordinary viewers are going to have a tough time figuring out what the heck is going on. And that is deliberate on the part of the movie. Wondrous sequence. Wonderful for filmmakers. And a lot of filmmakers have said they absolutely love this movie for its visionary qualities, and I have to completely agree with them. It, even though the aesthetic is often cheesy, which is part of, I think, what's going on, the dreams of Sam Lowry, deliberately cheesy and almost stupid, 
fantasy-like, but he is completely the opposite of a fantasy archangel god hero. And yet, that cheesy quality of the dreams is fascinating because it integrates into the reality of the movie and sort of contrasts with it. Now, the movie presents a harsh world of the 1980s. Even though it's retro-futuristic, has a great classic look to it, it's also 1984-like in terms of the aesthetics of, I think, George Orwell's novel. And yet we get really, really bitter commentary, and, and, and that's fine, on the real world, the modern world. You know, this movie comes out of the 1980s. I think people today, I have to explain this to my students a little bit, don't realize that back then you had the IRA bombings in England or in, in Britain, and then you had regular bombings in Israel that would be on the nightly news, and, and terrorist incidents like that. But then this movie unfortunately took on a life of its own or, or took on more meanings. Um, certainly after 9-11, the global war on terror and all the police state developments since then, including, unfortunately, the rise more, more and more of the surveillance state. So this movie unfortunately feels more relevant to me today, and I, I have lived through all of that, than probably it even did in 1985 when the reviewers then talked about how much this movie was about then Unfortunately, it's about now more than ever. So that makes this movie fresh, relevant, and alive. And that makes it a work of art that can continue to speak to the modern age, which unfor is, again, I'll say the word, it's unfortunate. I have often watched this movie, I wonder if you do too, as really a very harsh commentary on socialism. It's kind of like 1984 in that way, where George Orwell was an English socialist, and yet that book is a very harsh commentary on socialism of the day, becoming a kind of modern Stalinism or Stalinism slash Nazism. And then this movie, while Gilliam, I think, is a man of the left, actually, I'm sure of that, nevertheless is criticizing central services or information retrieval or information adjustment. The look of, the, of those bureaucracies, the harsh, cold, abstract quality of them, the stupidity of them, and then the Sam Lowry kind of tying all those together as this bumbling doofus who can't figure anything out as kind of a you know beta male or wimp in comparison to the, the girl of his dreams who is realized in the real world. You know, as the socialist bureaucrat, this movie is really, really, I mean, at least one way to watch it is that Tuttle is a hero figure and Central Services is the antagonist. Same thing with information retrieval and adjustment. And the movie has marvelous Kafka-esque qualities. For example, when Sam Lowry gets his, his office in information retrieval, I think this is an absolutely amazingly shot scene, wonderful scene, memorable scene where <laughs> his office, he's going to get a promotion, which probably means better pay. It gives him access to all the secret records of the society, and yet that's his office. That's what it looks like. What a commentary on governments or modern governments, period. Now, I'm going to do spoilers for just a little bit in this video to talk about the ending of the movie. So go watch the movie and then you can watch this video. What are we to think about the ending where Sam Lowry ends up in a torture chamber as a blumbling idiot? That's the truth or the ending of the movie in certainly the director's cut, I think probably the theatrical release. The movie for a little while gives you the sense that maybe Sam Lowry is rescued, a deus ex machina scene in which Tuttle and all these sort of ninja rebel figures come down and save him. He then gets the girl of his dreams and moves into that typical Gilliam rule fantasy location which looks to me like it's supposed to be cheesy here. If the movie ended there, it'd be a completely different movie, but we get the last few shots where uh-oh, Lowry is, in fact, in his own head. Now, Gilliam has said that he finds this ending somewhat hopeful because at least the guy has his dreams or can at least envision an alternative reality, which is an escape out of the jail, the ultimate jail that created by the state, which is symbolized probably by the torture chamber. One could read this the exact opposite way, though. The guy is a captive prisoner and he doesn't get to realize his dreams, therefore the state is all-powerful, all-controlling, a godlike figure, and has turned this perfectly normal guy who has visions and interesting visions into a bumbling doofus. In that sense, the movie is like 1984, although in 1984 the ending is that you know, Winston Smith is brainwashed and becomes the puppet of the state, the state that is all total, to totally totalitarian, can get inside a person's head and then can change his thoughts and effectively brainwash him. At least that's not the case at the end of the Brazil. So I kind of see what Gilliam is getting at here. Nevertheless, if you want to look at all of Gilliam's work, you know, he's got other movies in which the dreams do come true or the, you know, the visions of the normie person 
actually are kind of realized. And he plays with that throughout his filmography wonderfully. Go watch the, uh, I think, a very underrated movie, the Zero Theorem, which is kind of like this. And that ending is similar but different. But yes, Gilliam has other movies in which the visions are realized or, or the hero's delusions become a reality versus the harsh reality he's already in. You know, he, he's playing with that idea and he never, you know, has one way of looking at it or one way of presenting it to you. So I think all of Gilliam's other films or many of these other ones are worth watching along with Brazil. Brazil's a particular attitude or sensibility, one way of looking at the modern police surveillance state, but then these other Gilliam films are, are, you know, other ways of looking at the same thing. Anyway, what do you think of Brazil? I threw a lot at you about this wonderful movie. Let us know in the comments. Please also subscribe to this channel, my Substack, Letterboxd, etc. For more great content, have a great day.